I know that people have uh, tuned in here to Zoom to hear from Lara Boyd, so I will keep my opening remarks relatively brief. Uh, I would begin by pointing out that we have a number of events scheduled uh, by the Emeritus College in the next little while. Uh, the first of these is tomorrow at five o'clock when Kay Teschke will be interviewed by Jerry Wasserman in the Senior Scholars Series, uh, which we do in conjunction with Green College. And you can find the link on the Green College site. Uh, there are other events that will come up in the next week or so, uh, including uh, my microphone. a talk yeah. by uh, a group of people in the Emeritus College Conversations on uh, Writing Lives, and that includes uh, Cheryl Grace and Snedra New and uh, uh, Phil Resnick, chaired by Ira Nadell, and this will be an interesting reflection on a number of different approaches to writing about individual lives. Uh, there are other items that I won't go through in detail here, uh, but at the end of the session, you will see a slide with uh, further details. And I would say too, that all of this information is available on the website of the college to which I hope you will refer frequently. I would however, draw attention to one important uh, part of what we are doing and that has an impending deadline. And that is that we in the Emeritus College, as many of you I'm sure know, offer uh, awards every year. Uh, this year, there are two. Uh, there is the President's Award for Distinguished Service by a UBC Emeriti. And that award has been given now for a number of years. Uh, and the deadline for nominations is the 15th of January. And on the same date, we have the deadline for nominations for a second new award this year. It's the Award for Excellence in the Innovative and Creative Endeavors of Emeriti. And this is an award that the UBC Emeritus College has uh, put together and uh, is sponsoring. So please put on your thinking caps and submit your nominations as directed on the website uh, through the usual channels. Uh, we will be uh, announcing and uh, conferring those awards in the spring. Okay, uh, the other issue that I really wanted to talk about in this meeting is the restructuring of the Emeritus College. And if Sandra could share her screen, uh, I think it's probably easiest to talk to this diagram as I do that. Um, some of you will know uh, if you read the newsletter uh, that came out a little while back that we had embarked on a process of rethinking the organizational structure of the college and a version, a simplified version of this diagram appeared in the newsletter. Uh, at our last uh, meeting of the council, there was further engagement with the structure that is here on depicted uh, and the receipt of a report from an ad hoc committee, uh, which really fleshed out the, the effort that had gone into rethinking and mapping out the activities of the Emeritus College. Uh, fundamentally, uh, this diagram is uh, more evolutionary than revolutionary. Uh, it assembles together in ways that seem to make a lot of uh, sense in terms of synergy and consanguinity, the activities in which we have already been engaged and seeks to refine the administration of those activities as well as communication within the college uh, around these activities. So. Uh, in necessarily in this diagram, there are a number of abbreviations, but let me just suggest uh, as explanation that the programs cluster uh, really represents, among other things, the group that organizes these general meetings, the flag GM on the diagram, uh, but also will now become the umbrella group for making sure that such things as the Senior Scholars Series, the, the Kay Teschke event that I mentioned tomorrow, 
and the Emeritus College Conversations, as well as various ad hoc talks are delivered through the uh, period to come. Uh, there is a, a, a structure to all of this with uh, coordinators of the various clusters and conveners of such activities as the organization of the Senior Scholars Series. And if we move across to the right on the diagram to the activities cluster, I would note that here we have uh, already a group of established special interest groups which are generated by the enthusiasms of emeritus colleagues. There's a travel group, a photography group, a poetic odysseys group. Uh, we had a philosopher's cafe that used to meet in person and so on. Uh, these are interest groups that are really sustained by people coming together and are very largely self-orchestrated and self-organized. I would just say that there is room for many more and diverse opportunities within this cluster. Uh, we don't have a, a book or book groups. Uh, there could be various subgroupings of uh, reading groups, I suppose. We don't have hiking groups or urban exploration groups or cross-country skiing groups, music groups, and the like of that. So what I'm really doing here in pointing to this diagram in some detail is suggesting to the audience at large that there is room for you to really draw together with the help of the Emeritus College, uh, colleagues with like-minded interest to meet periodically to pursue activities or discussions. So uh, that, that all speaks to the kinds of activities that the college engages in that are for the edification and amusement, if I may say, of the, uh, the large group of emeriti. A fundamental part of what the college has done in the past has been to ensure that various aspects of the transition from a working life to a retirement life are as smooth and as uh, helpful and as supportive as can be. And these activities we have assembled into the Retirement Matters Cluster and here there are a number of committees, several of which uh, have existed for a long time, uh, and they will be organized and run as now by chairs and members of those committees. Uh, again, the restructuring makes quite explicit that there is room on these committees for people to hold up their hands, to get involved in one or other of the activities here. Uh, the chairing of, for example, the awards committee has been done for a number of years by Mark Thompson, uh, but there's room on that committee for other people interested in the important work of identifying and celebrating colleagues to contribute to the evaluation of the nominations. And most of you will know that we have uh, a program for reimbursing to some degree, subsidizing, the expenses that emeriti incur in continuing scholarly research uh, and other such activity. And likewise, there's room on this and all of the other committees for people in the membership at large to become engaged. So it's not so much of a, a veiled uh, argument here to say that the pitch of my message around this reorganization is that I would love you to uh, follow John F. Kennedy in the observation that the appropriate thing to do is not to ask what the Emeritus College can do for you, but what you can do for the Emeritus College. The college is already doing an enormous amount and has done this for years for Emeritus College of colleagues. And I think with the new organization, uh, this will only be strengthened and continued. But if we are to build and thrive and sustain the kinds of important contributions that have been made and which lie in the grasp of the college as an entity, I really do think that it's important for uh, as many people as possible to support the activities, not only by 
listening into talks, for example, but also by taking the interesting opportunity to shape one or other of these programs or get involved in decisions about questions of membership and the like uh, by volunteering to serve as conveners or as committee members in these activities. There'll be more on this in the next newsletter. And so I encourage everyone please to think about uh, how you can contribute to the work of the Emeritus College. With that, let me uh, just pause here and ask Sandra to put up a video from the United Way. This is another instance of ask not what uh, can be done for you, but what you might do. Uh, because uh, the United Way campaign is beginning and the uh, head of the campaign is here with us virtually uh, to say a few words about the campaign. Hello all. For those of you who have not yet had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Matt Dolph. I'm the director of UBC Wellbeing and also the current chair of the UBC United Way campaign. With a rich history at UBC, the United Way campaign has been an important part of our campus culture and community for over 40 years. Professors Emeriti have played an important part of the campaign by attending events and supporting this cause. Last year, Emeriti contributed a total of $42,500 to the annual campaign, which represents 7% of the total money raised. It almost goes without saying that this year the campaign is looking incredibly different. The one thing that is not different this year is how the UBC community has stepped up for the United Way. When the pandemic struck in March, United Way was able to pivot and help where it's needed most. Many of our neighbors suddenly found themselves underemployed and food insecure. Since then, United Way has supported the creation of 138 local food hubs, which have served over a million meals to those in need. Further, there are 25 community builders embedded in our neighborhoods to identify the needs of vulnerable individuals and families who've been impacted by COVID-19. While 2020 has been a challenging year for all of us, for the vulnerable members of our community, United Way has been there to support when they needed it most. From my work with UBC Wellbeing, I've learned that an important part of our community and the way that we thrive is to give back. Doing something deeply meaningful for others and building a greater sense of community is a very important way to build positive mental health and well-being for ourselves and our neighbors. Among our UBC community, we know that many members are feeling isolated. So this year, more than ever, we would all benefit from taking some time to give back and connect with others. Like always, I'm sure that this year the Emeriti will play an important role for the UBC campaign. Thank you for your support of the United Way. To give, please visit our website at unitedway.ubc.ca slash how to give. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, Matt Dolph at matt.dolf at ubc.ca or to email our campaign team at united.way at ubc.ca. Thank you and be well. Thank you, Sandra, for mounting the video. Uh, at this point, I would like to call on my friend and colleague, Carolyn Gilbert, to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. And that gives me very great pleasure. And it's also wonderful that we have such a big audience. I think we have, I don't know, 127, 128 people with us today, which is really nice, more than we would probably get together in an auditorium. Uh, Lara is an eminent neuroscientist and physical therapist based in UBC's physical therapy department in the Faculty of Medicine and the Center for Brain, Brain Health, where she directs the Brain Behavior Lab. She has held a Canada Research Chair and a Michael Smith Foundation for Health Career Scientist Award, and she was a Peter Wall Early um, Scholar. Actually, okay. Dr. Boyd also serves as the health research advisor to the vice president for research and as UBC's delegate to the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Her work is centered on answering the question of what limits and what facilitates neuroplasticity. I heard Dr. Boyd's talk at Santa Ono's installation 
as UBC president, and I know some of you did too. And some of you like me might be among the 27 plus million viewers uh, of her TED talk on YouTube. And so you know our brains will be different at the end of today's talk. We might learn what progress neuroscientists have made since those talks in understanding individual differences. Today, Dr. Boyd will talk about healthy brain aging. After the talk, she'll be happy to respond to some of your questions. Um, and you can ask questions using the chat function of Zoom. And after the talk, I'll put as many of the questions I can, uh, as I can to Lara. So Lara. Great. Thank you everybody for having me today. I um, really appreciate it. And let me just pull up my slides. All right. Great. I assume everyone can see those and someone will shout or wave at me if there's some kind of technical problem. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we are with one of the lines of research in my lab, which is our work around kind of some behaviors that might be shifting and shaping our brains in, in a positive way. And specifically today, I'm going to talk to you a lot about our exercise work. Um, but I thought maybe I'd give you a little bit of context as to you know how I got here and, and what um, shapes my interest at UBC. So I, I did start my career out as a clinical physical therapist and um, it didn't last very long, quite frankly. I treated patients for only about two years. And in, in large part, I did that, be, I, I, let, I changed careers because I was really frustrated with kind of our basic understanding of how the human brain works, how it works normally, how it works after it's damaged. And I really had the sense that we couldn't cure any disease or restore normal behavior or even help you know, ourselves and our children learn until we just had more fundamental knowledge about um, brain science. And so I uh, went back, I have a, a degree in neuroscience as well. And I will confess that I think I've really been lucky in that in the time of my, uh, my time in the field, we have just seen an explosion of technologies that help us do the kind of work that I'm interested in. So today I'll show you a lot of our data from MRI and I'm really lucky to be at UBC where uh, we very recently, about two years ago, opened the FIPKI uh, Multimodal Neuroimaging Suite in the Center for Brain Health. It's a project that I've worked on to get open for the last, actually, 12 years it took us uh, from start to finish on that, from writing the initial CFI awards to actually having it be open and fully functional today. That gives us access to technology, um, largely including MRI, but also including brain simulation and what we call non-invasive brain stimulation, which is another tremendous help for us in trying to map the human brain. So I broke my talk into three parts, mostly that kind of helps me orient myself and make sure I'm staying a little bit on time, which I will do my best to do today. So I wanna start off just by kind of framing our conversation and telling you a little bit about how the brain changes, how the brain changes with work and, and make sure we kind of start from the same place because I. Uh, I'm aware that probably um, we're from very diverse fields across the, the participants here today. So what I'm interested in is neuroplasticity and, and all that is is just how does your brain change? Um, and your brain is changing all the time. So it's changing to accommodate learning um, and it's structurally changing to allow us to learn new things. It's happening throughout the lifespan. So it's changing both as we mature and develop into adulthood and then changing throughout adulthood and then also as we age. And so as was alluded to by Carolyn, I always, I always have this on all my slides. I wanna remind you that you're doing this right now. So you're changing and, and shaping your brain every day, hopefully mostly for the better, but we can certainly shape our brains for the worse with our behavior as well. Which kind of leads me to the next kind of important idea is that um, the biggest driver of how our brains change is what we behave and what we engage in. And so it's what we call experience dependent. So the adaptive capacity of our brain is most influenced by our behavior, much more than it is influenced by, for example, um, a drug. There's no real drug we can take that shapes neuroplasticity. Um, and one of the other things that really in research we struggle against a little bit is that we find that neuroplastic patterns or how we change our brains are highly variable from person to person. And so as a researcher who's you know, trying to get to a certain p-value so I can publish my results in high-tier papers, high-tier journals, you can imagine how that um, 
is a frustration. Although in the last few years, I've decided to embrace the variability and that I've actually become really, really interested in variability. And I'll talk a little bit about it towards the end of my um, presentation today. And then the last important concept here is that neuroplasticity can be both positive and negative. So it's not always good to be changing our brains. And I'll give you some examples of both. So really, if you boil it down, then my research is dedicated to kind of thinking about the questions of what limits and what facilitates neuroplasticity in the brains. And then in humans, and um, both with and without pathology, trying to think about how we can design interventions to shape that plasticity. So um, I, I thought it would be interesting since we are all scholars and we've all you know, spent our careers basically helping people learn to try to talk to you about how does the brain learn and then do a little bit of a deep dive into our data that supports and illustrates some of the ways that we understand this. So when we learn, we have these three things we change in our brain. So our chemistry, our brain chemistry, our brain structure, and then the function of our brain. And so if I forget to say it later, I want to say it now, and that is it. These things are all happening together in concert. There are some different um, time courses that affect them, but they're all kind of happening and they're all interacting with one another and drivers of each other. So this picture I'm showing you here is an electron microscope view of actually neurons in the human brain. We have about, um, their estimates vary, but probably upwards of five to seven billion neurons in our brain. And somehow they function in an integrated and um, a kind of cohesive manner. Um, they're uh, really very elegant and beautiful. And um, you know what we see is they almost look a little bit like trees, I think. So we have these cell bodies, which are very clear here in the middle. And I think you can see that with my um, mouse pointer. Um, they then uh, have these long projections. These would be the long axons, um, long connections that can travel at long distances both um, throughout the brain and also down into the spinal cord. So imagine, if you will, you know, a, a cell body that's sitting in the motor cortex of your brain, which is up on the top kind of lateral surface of your brain, that that neuron might go all the way down to your low back before it makes its first connection to have these direct um, output connections to spinal cord neuronal pools. And so that, that axon could indeed be several feet long. We then have these branches that come out from it called dendrites and it's branching and it's through these branches that the neurons are connecting to adjacent neurons and then communicating with them. And so let me walk you through this a bit. So the first way your brain is changing when you learn something is, brain, is by changing its chemistry. So the way that the neurons communicate, and this is a, a cartoon over here on the left side of my screen, is they don't actually touch one another. They approximate one another very closely. And then there is a release of neurochemicals or what we call neurotransmitters that could cross that synaptic cleft, the area between the two neurons. And then that is how communication can happen. And in our brains, actually, communication is largely inhibitory. Mostly it's inhibitory neurotransmitters saying, don't go. But we also have excitatory neurotransmitters saying, OK, now go. And so there's this kind of mix of these back and forth across one another. And um, we can actually map those. I'm sorry, of course, my phone is ringing while I'm talking. There we go. I silenced it. And so we can actually map an approximation, not at the neuronal level, but more at the cluster of neuron level in humans using, this is from an MRI scan. This is an MRI scan from a patient in one of my studies. This patient's had a stroke. And so let me to orient you a bit here. Maybe we can look here on the far right first. So this is an axial slice. So this is if you're above my head and you're looking down into my head and you're looking at the two uh, cortical hemispheres, the two cerebral hemispheres. This is now a frontal slice. If you slice off the front of my head and you're looking straight in. So this is brain up here. And in this particular weighting of this image, of this MRI image, the, the brighter areas are showing fluid. So this is a stroke here in the white area on the side. This middle area, these are what we call the ventral brain. And what we're doing in, in this particular study is we're looking at the concentration of these neurochemicals in this green box. And we do this through um, a technique in MRI called magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So we can create a chemical spectra of the chemicals that reside within this box. We then can reduce it through some data analyses and extract the signal with different spectra of the brain. And so for example, here with this particular approach, 
we can see that in patients um, with mild versus very severe stroke, a difference in the chemical spectra for, for example, this is called glutamate. This is an excitatory neurotransmitter in the human cortex. And so we can see that this, these chemicals are changing rapidly in time. You can actually now map these chemicals in real time as someone's learning something um, and showing the chemical spectra changing in real time as uh, learning takes place. And these changes in brain chemistry are really neat because they can occur very rapidly. We can very quickly upregulate neurotransmitter in our brains. And this is what we think is the neurophysiologic basis for our short-term memories. Now, for short-term memory to become a long-term memory, we need to actually change our brain structure. And that's the second thing that's shifting when we learn. So this is a different kind of MRI image also taken from our scanner here at UBC. This is actually my brain. A lot of these are my brain because um, then I don't have any um, any uh, possibility that I might be um, showing uh, health data that I'm not authorized to. So um, this is me. And what I'm showing you here is a diffusion tensor image. And so what this image is doing is it's showing you all the water molecules and their capacity for diffusion along, along those long white matter axons I was talking about from the neurons. So here, um, the colors are just telling us the direction of the axons and how they're moving. So blue is up and down, and red is side to side, and green is front to back. And so what this is giving us is an idea of the connectivity of the brain. And we can see that these brain structures are very important for learning, and they're changing quite a bit with learning. So how do we know that they're important for learning? Well, we've done associative studies where we can say, if there's damage, in these white matter structures, what happens to the function of a patient or of a person? And so when we, when we do these diffusion images, this is more raw data here on the left-hand side, uh, we can extract information about water molecule diffusion from certain focal areas or regions of interest in the brain. So for example, here, we're very interested in these long descending tracks. This is out of the motor cortex. This is enabling us to make voluntary movements. This is called the corticospinal tract. And specifically, we're mapping an area of it called the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And it turns out the integrity of this posterior limb of the internal capsule is one of the very best predictors of whether or not you're going to have motor function after a stroke. And so, for example, we can look and we can see that, um, that this damage, how the magnitude of damage in this posterior limb in the internal capsule maps directly with the capacity to learn a new movement, maps directly with motor uh, skill learning such that lower um, integrity there. We measure this through something called fractionated anisotrophy. So lower fractionated anisotrophy, which is abbreviated FA in my slide, um, is going to map onto less change in motor skill with learning. And similarly, we know that it's very important these connections from side to side across the brain. It's called the corpus callosum. And so the two uh, cerebral hemispheres are connected through these very large bundles of fibers. And that uh, corpus callosum, this is, um, would be a, a side image of the brain or a sagittal image with eyes being out here in the front. And basically this would be the back of your head. So this is the corpus callosum as it runs from front to back through your brain. So the integrity of the callosum is very important um, in distinguishing between um, stroke severities as well as severely damaged by stroke, even when the stroke isn't directly affected. So even stroke in a distant region will affect this white matter tract. So this is one way that we know that white matter is important after stroke. Now, the conventional wisdom around white matter and stroke, um, and in terms of white matter and neuroplasticity for many, many years was that it didn't change. That if you damage the white matter in your brain, you didn't have a lot of capacity for neuroplastic change. And um, because of some really elegant work that actually was led by scientists from UBC, we now know that that's not the case. And so um, I don't know how, how you are, but it, I always find it really exciting when I realize that something I've been teaching for a lot of years is absolutely wrong as this, as this was. So if you took my neuropathology class on um, the Faculty of Medicine, if you took it before you know, 2010, I would have taught you that once white matter is damaged in the brain, there's very little capacity for recovery. But um, now when I teach that class, I say, well, it kind of matters how the white matter was damaged, where it was damaged, and there may indeed be capacity for recovery and change around that. This comes in um, large part because of work um, by our recently retired lead of the MRI um, imaging group. This is Alex McKay, who's a physicist um, here at UBC. And 
and he and his group were very instrumental in trying to help um, mapping of white matter in the brain um, after multiple sclerosis and in patients with multiple sclerosis. And so multiple sclerosis is a disease where your immune system actually attacks uh, what's called myelin in the brain. So this is a cartoon again of a neuron in the brain. So here's that cell body I showed you. These are the dendrites. And this is that long axon that's, as I told you, can stretch long distances in the brain and down to the spinal cord. Now that axon is actually wrapped in insulation. They're fatty little packets and that's called myelin. And the reason that it's wrapped in insulation is to present, prevent signal decay. Just like the electrical wires in your house or in your office, if you're in UBC today for some reason, that we have our wiring is wrapped in insulation. That allows the signal, the electrical impulse to be conducted rapidly and efficiently, uh, both in your walls and also in your brain and your central nervous system. So um, in multiple sclerosis, myelin actually is attacked and lost. And we see that then they, we have poor resultant brain function because signals can't travel across the brain. So um, Alex, was, uh, Alex McKay was able to discover a technique whereby we can separate a signal in what's called our T2 imaging sequences. We can separate that signal into the portion that is attributable to the water that's trapped in by the myelin around the axon versus water that's out in the extra and intracellular spaces. And thereby, we actually then have a measure that is a now histopathologically validated measure of myelin in the human brain. And that histopathology was done by my colleague and friend, Corey Lawley, who's also here at UBC. And she was able to look at both human and actually uh, bovine cow brains and line up very beautifully the myelin water fraction from uh, brain imaging with an optical density staining in these postmortem brains. And so we now have this really beautiful measure of white matter in the brain. We um, then looked at it with my research some years later and said, well, what happens to that uh, myelin after stroke? And not surprisingly, we discovered that myelin um, in, this, in the stroke brain is damaged both in that lesion side posterior limb of the internal capsule. We would have expected that, but it's also damaged very distant um, from the lesion itself. So on the other side, on the non-lesion posterior limb of the internal capsule. And also we see in our stroke patients, and they're here in red, just, I'm sorry, they're here in blue, healthy controls in red. In our stroke patients, we just find less myelin overall across the human brain. And so it, it suggests that something's going on in those patients. Stroke is not a disease of myelin. So some other process must be at play that's reducing the overall health and then conductivity of the stroke-affected brain. So we set out to discover um, whether or not myelin indeed might be neuroplastic, whether if we lose it, if it can be diminished, is there an intervention that can bring it back? And so the long and the short story is that, that our data have resoundingly showed us that myelin is indeed neuroplastic. And, and since the time that we started into these studies, there have been a number of animal studies as well that are also showing something similar. So I'll just show you a bit of our data. So the way that, that we've done these studies is we take a baseline MRI, we measure myelin. We then um, have a four week intervention, which in hindsight turns out to be way too much intervening, but we didn't know when we started this work. I really thought that it would take a huge amount of practice to induce myelin plasticity. So um, I'll show you the intervention in a moment. So uh, patients and healthy controls, older and younger, uh, participate in this. And we do a second follow-up MRI. And, and just as an aside, this, was study, uh, funded, this study was funded by uh, CIHR. And so this is our intervention. We didn't know what we could convince patients and participants to do what they would do something 10,000 times. So my graduate students assured me that a video game, that if it was a good video game, people would play it a lot. And so that turned out to be the intervention. So what we have here is a game that we've written in my lab. It's called TRAIT. It's tracking an intercept task, or we actually just call it the asteroid game. Because what's gonna happen here is this is my postdoc, Jason. And Jason, um, he's, his hand is being mapped by a Microsoft Connect which is right here. So it's a wireless way of mapping hand motion. His hand is going to be driving the spaceship and his job is to catch this asteroid and throw it into the sun. And if he's successful, he'll get a score of how many lives he's saved because if he doesn't catch this asteroid, it'll hit the earth, the earth will blow up and we'll all die. And so Jason is gonna to have to catch a series of asteroids. Now we have built this game so that as you get better, the game gets harder. So the asteroid um, 
will come at him from predictable locations. Oops, sorry. Um, but uh, it will become less predictable as he gets better at it. So here he is catching it. He's going to throw it into the sun, catch another one, throw it in. As the, as the participant gets better and better, the asteroid will come faster. Sometimes they only have a certain amount of time to catch it before it blows up. Um, it will hitch and jiggle. It will try to get away. And so this is a way that we can maintain the engagement of the participant across 10 sessions. And in each of those sessions, they're gonna make a thousand asteroid catches and throws. So when we do that, our healthy controls, um, these are young healthy controls, this is the first experiment we did, we actually find a, this is percent myelin water fraction, which is our index, so a percent myelin increase. We find about an 8% increase from baseline in the thickness of myelin in, in this particular brain region. This is the left intraparietal sulcus. And the intraparietal sulcus is really interesting because it's an area in the brain where we know where vision and hand movement are integrated. And so it makes a lot of sense that that would be shifted by myelin um, in healthy controls. And so our next question became, well, that's all well and fine, but what about other populations? What will we find there? And so actually these are data, we're just getting ready to send this paper, probably within the next two weeks, we'll send this out for publication. And so we find um, a similar pattern of change, and these are now individuals who've had a stroke. So we find um, three brain regions show significant changes in myelin with this same intervention. Um, this is the superior longitudinal fasciculus. So this is a long uh, band of connectivity from the front to the back of the brain. Again, our friend, the posterior limb of the internal capsule, this is on the damage side. And then the cerebral peduncle. So the output of the cerebellum down and coming up into the cortex of the brain itself. And I just wanna point out to you one thing though, that in our stroke patients, we do see a massive amount of variability from person to person in terms of the pattern of their change. So there's probably other things going on in these data that we need to unpack, but it seems that the overall pattern is telling us that people, and these are people with chronic stroke, so they've already gotten you know, most of their recovery, that they're um, really able to change their brain structure. Okay, and then lastly, as, as people are changing and learning, we see that brain function is also changing. And so I just wanna give you one example of that. This again is a study of people with stroke, and they were asked to learn uh, what we call a continuous tracking task. And the way that this study works is they do their first practice session in the MRI, they then practice outside the MRI for five days, and they come back and they do what we call a retention test. This is just a test, like you know, we would give in our classes. So pencils down, you know, notes away, how good are you at the task? Um, and that's on a seventh and separate day. And so the task that people are asked to do here is they're asked to put this red circle inside this open uh, circle this red dot inside this open circle. And they're doing this by moving a joystick. They're moving the joystick up and down with their wrist because they're laying in an MRI scanner. So we can have them doing a lot of big movements because they need to keep their heads still. And then we're mapping patterns of brain activity as basically they're either following this target as it moves randomly or as it moves in a repeated sequence. And so in these kinds of experiments, we can say that Chasing a random target can't be, can't be learned. It's always unpredictable. You can get better at moving the joystick, but you don't get better. You can't predict target movement. Versus doing something on a repeated sequence, you can actually learn and you'll see people get significantly better at that. And so what we do is we contrast change in random and repeated sequences. So this would be general motor control, we call it, on the random and repeated reflex learning. So we can dissociate these two across time and we find that both our individuals with stroke who are in open or in the circles and healthy controls who are aged and age matched in the triangles, both of them learn so they get better across time. So here, this is a root mean square error score. So down is better on this plot. And we find that they both improve more for the repeated sequence, which is in the filled um, symbols than the random one. So learning has the behavior part of the experiment is successful. What's interesting then though, is we look to see what's happening in the brain as these people are learning. And we see a, a dissociation between our stroke patients and our healthy patients. We find that our, in the prefrontal cortex, which is things for like decision, anticipation, um, that our healthy control group, um, once they've learned the sequence for the repeated sequence, they can pretty much turn off their prefrontal um, cortex. 
you can think about this as being analogous to when you're driving the car, you're just driving. You're not really thinking about the specific movements you're making to drive. So you can shut your prefrontal cortex off and that allows you to do other things. You can have a conversation, you can listen to the radio, um, your mind can wander and you can think about other things, which I know a lot of us probably do as we drive. Unlike, unlike that though, the stroke patients, they are really activating their prefrontal cortex to a much higher degree than our healthy controls. And so they're still having to pay a lot of attention to this task. It suggests to us that task is still very, very difficult to them. And we see a difference then with the premotor cortex, which is an area for motor planning. It's a movement related area. Here, our healthy controls are using their premotor cortex. It suggests this is just running a plan for movement. It's just being executed somewhat automatically. And we're seeing less of that shift to the premotor cortex in our stroke group. So this just shows that patterns of brain activity change. They're changing both for people who are healthy and for after stroke. Um, they change in different ways. And this is kind of the last way that that learning is supported in the human brain. So our brains are changing. They're changing a remarkable amount as we learn. And, and so this always leaves me with this series of questions. So our brains are really plastic. They're changing as we age. They're changing as we learn. Um, so we do seem to have though some limits on how much they can change. So you know, my big question is why can't we if our brains are neuroplastic, then why can't we learn anything we want to? Like, why not? Um, you know, why sometimes are kids who are really good learners, why do they sometimes struggle in school? What's going on there? Um, why don't my stroke patients get better after their brains are damaged? Why are our brains changing with aging? So kind of what, again, are the, the limits we're running against? So there are limits. We know that neuroplasticity is not always positive. We know that things like repetitive use injuries, chronic pain, drug and alcohol use, and particularly stress and anxiety um, will change the brain and change it in negative ways. So there's good examples of that. This is not my work. This is an older study, but I think it's really interesting. And it's looking at people who have chronic back pain and mapping the brains of people with chronic back pain shows us that they have increased reactivity in their brain to any kind of sensory stimulation, whether or not it's painful and whether or not it's related to their back. So it's almost like the sensory information gain of their brain is turned way up and they're oversensitive to it. And so it just suggests that we have this very big kind of global shift in response to this negative um, painful stimuli. Another thing that's negatively changing our brain is stress. And so I wanted to just maybe take a second on this particular issue because I think it's something that all of us are really dealing with right now in a much more significant way than, we, than we're realizing. So, um, you know, we know that the hormone cortisol is secreted by the adrenal glands. Normally a little secretion of cortisol is great in some ways. It's the reason we all woke up this morning, however it happened, whether you just woke up, that was because your cortisol rose to a level that woke you up or it was dark and your alarm shrieked in your ear and it scared the heck out of you. That's how I woke up. Cortisol also spiked very quickly in, in, my, in my brain. But cortisol helps us do lots of things like metabolize glucose, regulate blood pressure, regulate our immune function. And it can actually, in small and regular quantities, it enhances memory. So it kind of gives us that edge. You know, I'm getting ready to give a talk. I feel slightly nervous. I have a little bit of cortisol in my system. It's not a bad thing. So, but when we're under prolonged and high levels of stress, our cortisol stays high for longer times. I think that's what we'll call 2020, just in general, as the year of cortisol is my best bet. And so that can have some really negative side effects. It can impair our cognition, it can change our immune function, it decreases bone density, it can shift our, our uh, cholesterol levels such that we have higher levels of what we call LDL cholesterol, which is our bad cholesterol and lower levels of HDL cholesterol uh, can change the way we deposit fat in our bodies. And so we think about cortisol, we think about it as we want it to be this inverted U. So you wanna have just the right amount of cortisol. You don't wanna have too little, then you just can't wake up, you have low motivation and we really don't wanna have too much. And we know that when um, individuals have too much cortisol for too long, so they have these persistent uh, levels, high levels of cortisol, that it actually will block the expression of some of the brain growth factors that are important for neuroplasticity. Now, one of them I haven't really talked about yet, it's called brain-derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF. And we know that um, cortisol competes with BDNF. And when you have high levels of cortisol, 
and low levels of BDNF, we actually see atrophy or the shrinking of key memory structures in our brain. So one in particular, the hippocampus, which is very, very important for making new memories, actually becomes smaller when we have high levels of stress over a long period of time. Now, it's really hard to measure BDNF in the human brain because it's too invasive to actually go in and measure it. We don't have a surrogate for it. So this is animal work, but this is work even just showing that under extreme situations of stress, you can see not just changes in BDNF um, in adult animals, but you can actually see that that stress can even be transferred to their offspring. So in this example, um, rats were kept in a very small space, which they find very stressful. These were pregnant rats. And this high level of prenatal stress actually affected the rat pups when they were born. And we, you see these shifts in the ability um, to express brain-derived neurotrophic factor and this overexpression of cortisol, even in these pups. So here's a control pup, rat pup, and then here is the pup whose mom was stressed. And you see higher levels of cortisol in the mom stressed pup, and you see lower levels of BDNF. So there are these large, large and transferring effects. So it kind of leads us to this idea of, you know, how do we manage our cortisol, especially, I think, in today's world, um, there are a lot of things. People have studied Buddhist meditation. Um, this will significantly increase your cord decrease your cortisol and improve your blood pressure. Um, if you sleep better, so if you have eight hours of sleep, you find significant decreases in cortisol. And then this is what I'll spend the rest of our time together talking about. And that's the effect of exercise on brain health. So we know that exercise also um, has an interesting effect on cortisol in the brain. You see cortisol spikes high when you're exercising, but then it rebounds and stays at lower levels afterwards. And so we know that exercise can be really beneficial um, for stress reduction and for cortisol management. So this is what I then call exploiting neuroplasticity. So if we understand how it works, can we take advantage of it? Um, so one of the problems we have when we're thinking about how do we exploit plasticity is what I call the dose problem. And that is to change our brain um, can often take a lot of practice. So the brain is really interesting. If we're trying to learn a new declarative fact, so for example, um, I can throw out one that's random. I have a yellow lab, his name is Ben. Now, if you wanna to try to remember tomorrow what's you know, Lara's dog's name, um, and you come up with Ben after now I've said it twice, that's because it's what we call a declarative memory. So these kind of factual memories, if you find them interesting, they can be remembered after just a single or just a very low amount of practice of that information. For other things though, it takes a lot of practice. It takes what we call a large dose of practice. And so, um, especially um, in the movement and the motor systems where I'm very interested in learning, you, we know that we have these, we need these big, big doses of practice. So for example, you know, in my studies on myelin, I just showed you people did things 10,000 times. There's other studies, these are of healthy control showing that it takes 31,000 repetitions. And this is just to learn this very funky finger sequence in the study. Or in this particular study, this is the first example of neuroplasticity after stroke. This was in monkeys. But the monkeys had to practice something 9,600 times, so 9,600 before they got it. So a lot of my work is surrounded around, surrounded the question of, how do we get around doing something 10,000 times? And so we, we've looked at robotics. Um, we have a line of research in robotics underway in the lab. We do a lot of work with repetitive brain stimulation and that line of work's uh, going as well. But what I wanna talk to you today is our exercise work um, because it's relevant in many ways to kind of, I think all of us. And so um, we started this work um, several years ago trying to think about how do we make the brain into a better learning machine, if you will. So we know that exercise does some pretty great things to the brain just in general. Um, it increases blood flow. We, we build more blood vessels when we're exercising or after exercise. People who exercise regularly have more uh, both uh, gray and white matter in their brain. So you see bigger brains in exercisers. We see that it can promote neuronal growth, um, growth factors, including brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Neurotransmitters are more easily secreted in people who do use chronic exercise. And I already mentioned to you that, you know, really, or there's a lot of data, excuse me, that suggests it improves what we call declarative or factual memory formation. And so here's just an example. These are from mice. These are just two individual neurons. 
this is from a mouse that was not allowed to exercise. So mice, a mouse's normal state is to exercise. Um, they love to run on wheels and explore. And so if you prevent a mouse from exercising, it's very stressful for that animal. And what you find, this is an axon, you find, or a neuron, um, you find fewer dendrites off uh, mice when they're uh, not allowed to exercise versus in their normal state when they are. This probably relates to both the stress of not being able to exercise as well as just the actual act itself. So we designed a number of studies in my lab to try to start to unpack what's going on with exercise and how we might use it as a learning intervention. So I just want to point out my studies aren't designed to improve cardiac health, although exercise does that. My studies are really designed around how do I make the brain better at learning. And so here's the basic outline of all the studies I'll talk about from here forward. So people come in and they do baseline tasks. They do some, they try to learn something new. They might engage in a new skill. They, we also then will map um, brain excitability. And I'll talk more about that. They then engage in an exercise session. And what's really important about this exercise session is it's really, really short and it's really, really hard. So they do nine minutes of exercise. They do three times, three minutes of exercise at 90% of their maximal capacity. So this is extremely hard and fast. And this is what we call HIT exercise. It's high intensity interval training. So H-I-I-T, HIT exercise. They do their exercise, then they repeat. We repeat on um, the practice and we repeat the neurophysiology, the measures. And then 24 hours later, they come back for a retention test. So at the retention test, we again, remap their behavior and remap their brain function. Okay, so the most important slide I'm gonna show you are these next two, honestly. So when we do that, we call it a sandwich exercise. We map them, they exercise, we map them, we wait 24 hours and we map them again. So if we just look at one day, so these are the data, the short-term learning data, or what we call motor performance data. So um, this are uh, individuals that come into my lab, they practice this learning task. This is a, a robot in my lab, it's called a Kinarm. And the participant is looking at a screen, they don't actually see their hand and projected on that screen is a series of targets. And they have to move as, as quickly and accurately as they can between the targets and the targets light up such that every time they hit one, a new one appears. So they're gonna follow a sequence of movements and they're gonna hit these targets rapidly with their, usually their non-dominant arm. And we're gonna compare that then to a series of randomly occurring targets. And they do this, they engage in their exercise and then they do the practice again. And when we look at that in the short term, all within one day, we see absolutely no effect of exercise whatsoever. So in the short term, exercise has no effect on learning, zero. And so we see here, there, this is our rest group in gray and our exercise group in black. So um, there's no difference for a repeated sequence. There's no difference for a random sequence. So we stop the experiment here. We would say exercise has no effect on learning, at least for this experimental task. Um, when we bring those people back and they do this, they do it again on a second day. Now on the second day, the retention test day, there's, we don't have them exercise. They just come in the lab and they perform the task on my Ken arm. This is the Ken arm set up again. And so all they've done is go home and have time and sleep happen in between the two sessions. When they come back, look at the difference now between this is the rest group and this is the exercise group. So up is better. And we see this highly significant increase in the amount of um, learning that's occurring for the exercise group that happens overnight. And so we think that what exercise does, it helps the brain um, consolidate the memory. So form a memory that can be accessed later. And we think that that process takes time and we think that that process takes sleep. And so learning effects are only evident after a 24 hour delay. So you have to come back and look at them the next day. And you see that the really significant effects are for the exercise group and it's for the repeated sequence that's been practiced. This is not a statistically significant difference for the random group. So it's very specific to the sequence that was actually practiced and learned, which is pretty exciting data. We've done this actually with a number of different experimental tasks now, and it's always very robust and consistent finding. So we've then looked and we wanted to know well, what's happening in the brain. So what's allowing this to happen? And here we used um, our brain stimulators to map 
of cortical physiology changes in humans, behaving humans. And so just to sum this up, because I have to go kind of quickly through the next bit, and it's pretty, it's kind of technical, but generally we find that almost every system we can map um, is changing. So we see more long-term like potentiation, so the brain's uh, better capable and ready to change. We see changes in facilitatory inhibitory patterns. We see changes in how the two hemispheres are interacting, so the intercortical inhibition, and we see the way the cerebellum is acting on the brain is also changing. So um, we have this amazing tool now um, called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And we have a couple of us here at UBC who use this now, myself and uh, Fidel Avila Rodriguez who's in psychiatry, does experiments like these, but in people with depression. So what this allows us to do is to interact with the human cortex to see how patterns of excitability um, are changing. And the way this works is um, these machines, um, these TMS machines deliver electromagnetic current through a coil. This is a TMS coil. Um, this electromagnetic current passes through the skull, it passes through painlessly, and it induces an action potential into um, neurons in the top layers of the cortex. And so the way that we can measure its effect most easily is to stimulate over the motor area of the brain. It then induces a pulse, an electrical pulse that travels down through the spinal cord into the spinal cord interneuron pools. It makes one synapse. It then comes out and it activates a muscle. And then we can measure that activation through electromyography placed upon that muscle. And we get what's called a motor evoke potential. We get a little response out in the periphery. So when we do this, we can use lots of different techniques around it to understand what's happening after exercise. So the first is something called paired associative stimulation, where we, um, we coincidentally time sending pulses of, electromag of electromagnetic current um, down uh, from the cortex and then also up from the periphery. And they coincide in the brain at the same time, and that induces what we call long-term potentiation. We then can map that change in excitability, and we can see this increase in what we call long-term potentiation like excitability, again, in our exercise group immediately after exercise. So we can then say that this exercise is increasing plasticity in the brain. We can look at inhibitory and um, facilitatory um, interneuron circuits, and this is within a cortex, so this is intracortical changes. We can do this by varying the timing between two pulses delivered in rapid succession. Um, when we do this, we can find that, or we do find that exercise both increases facilitation, so it makes the cortex more excitable, and it decreases the amount of inhibition in the cortex. So it, those two things together make the cortex more excitable in general. And this effect on the release of inhibition seems to be stronger in the dominant hemisphere, which is the left hemisphere, if you're right-handed, which all of our participants were. Um, we also find that the interactions between the two cortical sides has changed, such that we find that the inhibition from one side to the other is much reduced. And we see that very um, nicely across the two sides of the cortex together. And then lastly, because I want to finish up in about three or four more minutes, so I have time to let you guys ask me questions. We find that um, the activity of the cerebellum being placed upon the motor cortex itself is greatly shifted. So normally, the output of our cerebellum, which is kind of this old and very important part of our brain um, on the, in the back, it's in the back of our head back here. Normally, the output of the cerebellum is all inhibitory. So it's basically sending direct inhibition up to the motor areas of the brain saying, don't go, don't go. And what we find is that immediately following exercise, that inhibition is released. We can do this by mapping the cortex and, and cerebellum simultaneously. So this is what we call a double cone TMS coil. We stimulate over the cerebellum, and then about five milliseconds later, we stimulate over the motor cortex. And if we were to do that normally, we would find that um, when you pair the two together, we get a very small motor evoke potential versus if you just stimulate over motor cortex, you get this big one. 
and this is just to confirm that same effect before exercise, then after exercise, we see that the, this, what we call the condition stimuli, the one where the two are together, is much larger. So that's showing us that the cerebellum is placing much less inhibition on the cortex after exercise. So you put that all together, what we think we have is a neural environment that's really primed to facilitate neuroplastic change. Now, everything I've shown you thus far has been in healthy controls, in young healthy controls. That's where all of this work started. All of that's published. We now are just publishing and beginning to publish the results of a CIHR funded um, randomized control trial that is comparing healthy controls uh, and individuals with stroke doing that same intervention, except for now they're doing five days of exercise plus practice. So we're trying to broaden this out. So if you have multiple sessions of exercise, what happens? And we're finding very similar things. Now, right now, unfortunately, um, I'm gonna make this into a verb. I've been COVIDed. I think probably all of us know that feeling. We had four participants left to run in our stroke group and they were scheduled and two of them were halfway through the experiment when we were shut down by COVID last March. Um, so at this point in time, I don't have my full stroke uh, cohort. And so what we've done in my lab is we're going ahead and we're publishing the data from the healthy controls. And these are now older healthy controls. So it's actually really interesting and important data. And um, I don't feel that it's safe for us to do exercise studies right now for people who have strokes. And so we are just um, kind of on hold for the finishing this experiment. Um, but I do have really exciting preliminary data from our older healthy control group, which had just wrapped up data collection uh, before we were shut down. And so we basically find what we had already found in younger people, but this is pretty exciting because no one's ever looked at whether or not these effects translate um, to older individuals. So these are people from 55 to 90 years of age. They've engaged in multiple sessions of exercise, high intensity exercise, as well as uh, the learning session. And we find um, improvements in learning. And by the way, those improvements, exercise related improvements are retained to one month after the experiment. We find increases in long-term like uh, plasticity. And we see differences in how they're activating their brains. And so for this experiment, we also did um, brain uh, function studies. This is a resting state functional brain MRI. And excitingly, um, we find differences in our healthy control group who exercise in how the cerebellum is being activated. And this is um, greater cerebrality greater cerebellar activity um, for the exercise group after the learning intervention, and also how key memory structures are interacting. So this is our hippocampus and how it's interacting with our frontal cortex in these group of older folks. So this is um, really exciting data. It should, again, be going out for publication in the next few weeks. Now, just a couple last thoughts, just two or three, really. One thing I want to just give you a caveat on is that exercise does not seem to always benefit everyone. And it's really interesting and we're not sure why. One small study we did um, in collaboration with Mike Kabor in the Center for Molecular and Medical Therapeutics um, was looking at some uh, genetic markers. And one thing that we found was um, that uh, genetic markers for dopamine may be indicating who shows the most benefit from this high intensity exercise intervention. These are now data only from young healthy controls. We haven't run our older people through this experiment yet, but what we find is that uh, people who um, are what we call homozygotes for the expression of dopamine and specifically for a form of dopamine called COMT, so the homozygotes who carry two copies of this particular uh, allele, they seem to have an extreme or a very strong benefit uh, from the exercise intervention, where the heterozygotes or the people who are what we call lice carriers uh, do not. So this may be one explanation for the variability that we sometimes see in our data. And so um, we're trying to start to unpack this and understand why not everyone benefits um, equally. Another issue that we've thought a lot about in the lab is that it seems that people who start off and are more fit show a stronger benefit from the exercise intervention. And this makes me particularly nervous because um, those of us who live here in Vancouver, compared to Canada in general, we're oddly fit people. 
Um, if you look at like our average uh, aerobic capacity as a population, it tends to be much higher um, than other places. So um, I have another clinical trial that's currently on hold. It's a multi-site trial where we're gonna be doing the same experiment. We're gonna be collecting a cohort here in Vancouver and my good friend and colleague in St. John's, Newfoundland, which is a very different population than we have here, uh, Memorial University in, in Newfoundland is going to be doing the same experiment. And then we're going to be able to combine our data and try to understand if there's regional variability in this fitness question. I hope we can start this study next summer. Um, and then likely we think that the effect of exercise on brain health is a, is a combination of factors. So it probably matters greatly, you know, your, your age, maybe, maybe not. Our data is helping with that question. Sex, we actually don't know. Um, we're just working on disaggregating the effects for men and women. Um, but fitness level may matter. We think genotype matters. There's different ways of combining exercise. I've just shown you a high intensity exercise intervention, but there's other ways to look at this. And then those overall effects, it may matter on what memory, what type of memory you're trying to shape. So just so you know that the prescription of exercise is really highly varied and individual, but generally um, it's extremely positive. Um, so just to kind of wrap all of that up, you know, um, I just wanna remind you that when you're trying to change your brain, your behavior is the largest determinant of how your brain changes and of your brain health. Um, I hope I've convinced you that exercise is helping your brain to learn. It helps you prime your brain to learn both in the short and then in the long term. We're now showing these nice one month follow-up and persistent effects. It's positively affecting the, your brain neurophysiology at multiple levels. It's hopefully reducing your cortisol and increasing your brain derived neurotrophic factor and just generally allowing you to be a better learner. So um, with that, I'm happy to take your questions. It's a huge thank you to, um, this, is the, this is my lab. People who are bolded are in the lab currently, and people who are a little bit bigger are those ones who really contributed to this work. Big shout out to Cameron Mang, who really started me off on this exercise path. Uh, he's now a faculty at University of Regina, um, and Jason Neva, who's now just recent faculty at University of Montreal. And just in case you haven't been there in a while, to remind you how beautiful our campus is, um, thank you so much. And I'll stop sharing my screen um, and uh, then be able to see the chat, I hope. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Laura. So I think I'll ask one of the more recent questions first, since um, we're thinking about exercise. And one member wants to know, have studies investigated longer duration, lower intensity exercise effects, such as Nordic skiing, swimming and running and so forth? Yeah, there are so many ways to think about exercise. Um, Generally, people who are what we call chronic exercisers have much improved brain health. Um, and I just want to emphasize that, that can happen a, a lot of different ways. So um, there are a lot of this work is on just older adults and brain health and exercises been done by Art Kramer. And he's used a ton of just walking interventions. So just getting out and walking for 30, 45 minutes, an hour a day have these very profound effects on exercise. So I should stress, you don't have to do high intensity exercise. Um, uh, we really did that in the lab so that we could then capture the neurophysiology of it. But um, anything like hiking, skiing, there's many pathways to these same beneficial effects. They haven't all been studied, but there's no reason to assume that there would be an advantage of one over the other. Great. So that takes us to piano playing. <laughs> Is a professional piano uh, player much healthier than the average person due to repetitive exercise? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that. So um, piano players and musicians in general are a totally different kettle of fish. Your brain is so amazingly different than the rest of ours um, that it's almost warrants its own study. So, um, so when we talk about exercise in general, um, one of the key elements there is the cardiac elevation. So elevating cardiac stress. So you're not going to get those effects from piano playing. However, um, people with musical training have such rich interconnections in their brain, especially across the callosum, which is this, you know, these big bands connecting the two cerebellar hemispheres and not always in the expected way. So one thing that piano players can do specifically is 
kind of shut down their callosum so their hands can do totally independent things at one at the same time. And so we see that in people with musical training, you tend to have better outcomes from any form of brain damage just based on musical training, just full stop. And it doesn't even have to be that you've continued your training into adulthood, even just training as a child. So my mom forced me to take piano lessons, even though I was terrible and hated it. Um, I still should have that benefit from all of those years of pain and suffering, which was what it was for me. Um, where um, when I do have my stroke, God hope I don't, but if I do have a stroke, I should see a better outcome than if I had never trained. In our studies, we often have to exclude musicians because they're so very different in terms of their brain. Um, we are actually, and I didn't talk about this today, but um, I'm working with the UBC Opera Program with Nancy Hermiston and Janet Worker from the Language Sciences Initiative to actually study how musical training opera specifically, in this case, is changing brains um, of our UBC students. And if you're interested in that, um, I didn't mean to shamelessly self-promote, but next Tuesday at noon, we'll be talking about our data in the Brain Wellness Symposia. And I could perhaps send that to you, Carolyn, that link, and um, people would be welcome to join in. If That's you want. great. We would love to do that. Thanks. Yeah, so a totally different set of studies, and so something we're engaging in right now. Yeah, that's great. Okay, here's a more scientific deep one here. Can transmag stimulation improve function in patients with psychotic mental illness? That's the question that Fidel Vila Rodriguez is asking. And hi, Darlene, it's nice to see you wherever you are. I can't see everyone. Um, that's the question that Fidel's been working on. So there is a um, study he has going on right now where they're looking at multiple sessions of um, transcranial magnetic stimulation. In this case, they're stimulating over the prefrontal cortex and altering the way the prefrontal cortex is being activated. Um, his studies, he has one in very severe depression, and I believe he has one um, in psychosis right now as well. Um, again, along the lines of COVID making our lives difficult, I know that some of Fidel's work has been disrupted because his work was being done actually in the Detweiler Pavilion, which is a lockdown unit. And because then it's considered a long-term care facility, I'm not sure those studies may actually be on hold right now because they're not allowed to be coming and going in and out of that um, particular area of the hospital. But um, Darlene, why don't I send you his email? Because you might want to have a chat with him. Because um, that's outside my content, but I know that the, that work is underway in some fashion. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, John Cairns congratulates you on very interesting data and asks, in the myelin growth experiments in response to video games, it looks like there's an enormous variability in response. Are the comparisons blinded to intervention and are the differences statistically significant? Yeah, so everything I showed you was significant. Um, those are some of our early graphs and it is really variable. And that it's really interesting that I like to show data like that. I don't, uh, I don't like to pretend that we're not seeing these crazy variable responses. One of the things that I, I didn't have time to get into and perhaps I should have um, one of the really fascinating um, relationships that we find in our myelin studies is that we now uh, create changes in the behavior, in the hand function, the arm function. We, we um, have an algorithm, we put those into, we map them out as an exponential function. And when we do that, we can actually calculate a rate of change. So how fast, if you will, is someone learning? We find that that variability is actually related to these rates of learning, um, such that people who aren't showing huge amounts of change in their myelin are those who are showing very fast rates of change. And our interpretation is the task might be too easy for them. So they, 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 the rate of change is really fast, like they get it really quickly. And so they may not have any need to build myelin, if you will. They may already have the brain structure necessary. So that's kind of where we are with those data. That's one reason it's not out um, entirely out for review yet. Because we're trying to unpack, our, is that variability related to these behavioral um, variability and response that we see? And I actually think that it is. My, actually, my students are working on some analyses on that right now. So you have to have me back in a few more years. Maybe I'll understand it better. <laughs> okay, and here's a follow-up for the myelin sheath um, question. Is the, uh, the myelin sheath response is interesting. 
says Roy Saunders. Um, however, since we're talking plasticity, is there any increase in actual neuron regeneration capacity? Previously thought that uh, more highly specialized tissues uh, to regenerate worse, and so uh, neuron cells never regenerate. But recent studies show there's capacity for neuronal neoregeneration. In other words, to what extent can actual neuronal loss be recovered, and can this be affected by intervention? Yeah, that's the that's the ten bazillion dollar question, isn't it? So. The capacity of the human brain to generate new neurons is probably very limited. At least we think. <laughs> I'm really happy to be wrong on that account, by the way. I hope someone proves me wrong tomorrow. Um, there, there may be some instances where specifically in our hippocampi, these key kind of key memory structures that we are building new neurons, but we don't think there's much capacity there, frankly. So when we're talking about plasticity, we're really talking about rearranging the deck chairs, if you will. So we have a certain number of them and we're trying to reorganize. Now, in terms of the myelin story, it is fairly significant that we can improve or reduce the conduction speed of, of information flow across the brain. And we now think that actually it's a, it's a very um, intimate and elegant process why, whereby Kind of the important thing in the brain is signals arriving in the right place, but also at the right time. So it may be that one of the things the myelin is doing is increasing and decreasing in order to kind of fine tune this timing. And so what I've shown you is really very blunt because that's kind of the, you know, we, we operate in these very chunky levels when we're imaging the human brain. Um, there's some really elegant and beautiful work um, that's being done now where they're really looking just at single neurons in a dish and, and having them interact maybe with another neuron, like a one-to-one -one or maybe a two-to-one -one kind of thing. And they can actually show the myelin in real time. And it's, um, it's myelin supported by what's called uh, by oligodendrites in the brain. And the oligodendrites are getting both thicker and they're getting wider and in real time. And they're, they're, they're doing this, it's very dynamic. So they're both getting wider and narrower and thicker and thinner as the timing needs are varied across the experiment. So I don't know if that helps. I think we're really early days in understanding how these cellular processes are taking place in the brain and then how they're supporting this kind of crazy elegant behavior we engage in. But it's kind of a, a first kick at it. Okay, great. Uh, there seem to be many of us who are interested in why we need eight as opposed to oh. six hours of sleep for optimal cortisol. Control. Yeah, well, I hope my slide wasn't backwards. So the slide was supposed to say, um, people who sleep eight versus six hours, or if, if you, the, the, the takeaway is if you sleep eight versus six hours, your cortisol is less. Yeah. Um, so it appears that um, just sleep deprivation is a major stimulant of stress in the human brain, causes the adrenal glands to express more cortisol and um, so then we have those associated effects. So the, the concern and the kind of the implication of that is because we're all chronically sleep deprived, what you're putting yourself into is a state of chronic elevated cortisol. So if you can start to regain a more normal sleep pattern and having more and more sleep, you'll see the cortisol levels um, going down. And so that, that's the idea there. So eight might not be the magic number for you. It might be closer to seven, um, but most adults really do need seven or eight hours of sleep, even though we like to pretend they only need five or six. Okay. So if that, if uh, anyone who asked the sleep question wants to follow up on that, please let me know. And, yeah, uh, I can send papers if you want. Sleep's not exactly my field, but it is one of the things that's kind of a key uh, thing we can manipulate uh, to try to uh, change our cortisol levels. Of course, so the that, hardest thing to do when you're stressed is sleep. So it's <laughs> chicken in an egg kind of thing. Yeah, so th there apparently is an independent body of research that shows that that more than six is, seems to be the magic number. Yeah, sorry about it. The slide was wrong, Wendy, I'll check it. No, it wasn't. It was probably how I said it. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I will double check that. I can see Wendy, Wendy's the one who asked the question and said the slide's wrong. So oh, yeah, it. but several other people have followed that up and said, please ask that one. <laughs> yeah. So we did. Um, okay, another question from uh, Barbara Rutherford is, I think you reported that the cerebellum is inhibitory 
Uh, one side slide suggested exercise decreased cerebellar inhibition after exercise, but the final slide suggested increased activity of the cerebellum after exercise. Wouldn't increased activity increase inhibition? Yeah, um, so it, that's really interesting. So it's kind of a, the, the disconnect between the two different kinds of experiments. So we, we don't see that the cerebellum is acting less we see that his output is differing. So it's still acting upon cortex, but that activity is less to inhibit and more to facilitate. Um, so that's an artifact of my going too quickly. And we do see what's very interesting is in particular in the learning studies that the cerebellum is much more important for learning than we thought. We've always, the cerebellum's a real mystery. We, for a long time, you know, neuroscientists, and I'm sure there's others on the call who are neuroscientists, you know, the cerebellum was always thought about being important for balance. It's kind of where it's an old idea. And we now find the cerebellum is involved in just loads of everything, everything from emotion now to learning, being very important for learning. We often see it pop up in our learning studies in a very significant way. And so it did again in this most rest, recent resting state paper, um, suggesting that at least in older adults who exercise, it, it's very active during the learning process, um, which is really, really interesting. And I didn't talk much about resting state, but it's a, it's a very cool way that we can actually measure brain activity when the participant's doing nothing. So your brain's active even you're, when you're at rest and seemingly doing nothing. And that activity is actually can be a reflection of recent experience. And so for people like me, I try to study movement, but I'm trying to do it in an MRI where no movement's allowed. So it makes my life really challenging. Um, and so one of the ways that we can get around this is by using these resting state approaches as an approximation for what, what just happened. So it's not, it's not quite a one-to-one -one with the electrophysiology data. Okay. Well, I see no more questions. This is the last chance, everyone. If you've got one, put it now. <laughs> so I guess we are done. Some of us probably need to go back and review the recording before we have our, can formulate our questions because it did go very fast. but. Very, very interesting. I'm so, sorry. I always have you. way more I want to talk about than I have time. But um, well, please come again. <laughs> yeah. Well, you all know where to find me if you want to talk further, if you'd like a paper or a clarification. Right. And I noticed that PubMed says that you have 168 publications. So we have a little reading <laughs> matter if we would like to pursue it that way. <laughs> I can direct you to some of the some of the ones I talked about today if you're interested. So sure. Okay, so we'll be in touch if that if that needs to be done. But thank you so much, Lara, thank from all of us. Take care, really everyone. Appreciate be safe. you being here. Thanks. Okay, so the meeting is um, just about over. Before we go, though, I just want to remind you of the other events coming up. And um, so, on I think Sandra will be showing that now. So. Um, the next general meeting will be on February 17th, and we'll be giving you more information about that later. But we still have three more um, meetings, kind of general meetings coming up before um, the turn of the year, in addition to several interest group meetings. So you see them here, the senior scholars uh, next week with Kay Teshke. And then the following week, um, or is that the same week? We have a conversation on Writing Lives, um, where three people will be uh, moderated by Ira Nadell to talk about just different aspects of biography or autobiography. And then uh, on December 8th is our final, um, well, the, the second of three actually sessions on finance um, in retirement and in these COVID times. So please watch for those and be sure you sign up to get the Zoom addresses. So without further ado, I think we will say thank you for coming. It was wonderful to see such a big audience and have a, such a, an interesting talk. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next occasion. So goodbye.